Hello and welcome to Teaching Bio. Today we're going to look at biological molecules and carbohydrates specifically, otherwise known as saccharides. So, before we begin, we need to understand what monomers and polymers are. So, a monomer is a small unit of something, whereas a polymer is many of these monomers joined together. So, many monomers form a polymer. So, the monomers and their respectable polymers that you need to know for biology are in this table. So you need to know that many many fatty acids slash crystallides make lipids, and many nucleotides make DNA and RNA, and many amino acid monomers make protein, and many monosaccharide monomers make a polysaccharide. So you also need to know some uh, chemical reactions as well. So a condensation reaction joins two molecules together with the formation of a chemical bond and the removal of water. And this is when we go from monomer to polymer. However, we can do the reverse with a hydrolysis reaction, which involves the breaking of a chemical bond between two molecules and involves the use of a water molecule. Hydro, water. And thus we can go from polymer back to monomer. Now, as I said before, carbohydrates are known as saccharides. And saccharides are basically just molecular compounds made up of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. And monosaccharides, for example, glucose and disaccharides, such as sucrose, are quite small molecules. And they also are known as reducing sugars. This basically means that they are able to act as a reducing agent and reduce other compounds, i.e. cause it to gain electrons. Remember from GCC chemistry, oil rig, oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons. So the reducing sugar will cause another compound to gain its electrons, and therefore reduce it. All monosaccharides are reducing sugars, and some disaccharides are reducing sugars. And polysaccharides are many of these monosaccharides joined together, and they are quite big, for example glucose, but no polysaccharides are reducing sugars. So, glucose, obviously, is apple, monosaccharide, and you need to know that it's a hexo sugar and it's also a reducing sugar. There are two isomers of glucose. An isomer is basically just the same uh, compound, but just a different version of it. And you need to know about alpha glucose and beta glucose and what they look like. So, for alpha glucose, it's H and OH, whereas for beta glucose, it's OH and H. Everything else is the same. The way I remember this is that alpha has a H in it, therefore H is at the top, beta doesn't, and it's going to be the opposite of that. So we need to be able to know how we can actually test for these reducing sugars, and we use the Benedict's test. So as I said before, all monosaccharides, subdisaccharides are reducing sugars. So reducing sugars will reduce copper 2 sulfate to form copper 1 oxide precipitate when heated, okay? So what we do with the Benedict's test is we take a solution that we don't know what it is, we want to test for it being reducing sugar, we add Benedict and heat. Okay, heat is important. Add Benedict and heat. And then whatever colour it turns to will tell you how much sugar is present and if there is actually any reducing sugar. So if it's blue, it means that there's no reducing sugar present. If it's green or yellow, it means that there's some reducing sugar present. If it's orange, there's quite a bit. However, if it's brick red, which is the copper 1 oxide precipitate, Therefore, there's a large amount of reducing sugar present. So, the Bendix solution can also be used with other compounds, uh, other reactions to sort of see whether something is a reducing sugar or even a non-reducing sugar. So, here we go. So, we have a test tube and we add Benedict and heat to that solution. And then we observe any sort of colour change. For example, there could be no change or it could change the red-brown, brick-red precipitate we talked about which would say it's uh, reducing sugar. However, there might not be a colour change, but we can't immediately assume it's not sugar at all. It could be a non-reducing sugar. This is a reducing one, but we can also use Benedict's to find out if it's a non-reducing sugar. So what we do with our solution then is we place it into a test tube and add dilute hydrochloric acid and also heat it again. Okay, so we've already added Benedict's and heated it. Then we're going to add some dilute hydrochloric acid and heat it again. And then, we're going to neutralise that hydrochloric acid with sodium hydrogen carbonate, NaHCO3. This is just a type of alkali. So it's all just about neutralising that. And then we observe a colour change again. If it changes to red slash brown after breaking it down, this is hydrolysis, 
So after hydrolyzing it with acid, then it's a non-reducing sugar. For example, sucrose is a non-reducing sugar. But if there's no change at all, then this is definitely not a sugar and it could be anything else. Equally in the exam, and also as one of the required practicals, you need to sort of understand how to do a calibration curve using serial dilution. So you may use solutions of non-glucose concentration reacting these as Benedict's and measuring the light absorbed of the colouring to create a calibration curve. You may then use this curve to estimate the glucose concentration in an unknown solution by measuring its light absorbed after adding Benedict's and using the graph. So you would plot a graph of glucose concentration against light, a percentage light absorbance or light absorbance in arbitrary unit using a colorimeter and then have sort of a sort of graph and then if you want to find out the concentration of glucose in a normal solution you find out the absorbance read from the graph having a line of best fit and just go down for example one might have 200 we go across we go down and it's got 0.1 glucose concentration there. okay so now moving on to disaccharides so a condensation reaction between two monosaccharides, monosaccharide, monosaccharide, forms a carbon 1,4 glycosidic bond. So all this means is that it's between carbons 1 and carbon 4. And this bit here, this oxygen, is known as the glycosidic bond. A condensation reaction is a reaction in which two molecules slide together to form a larger molecule producing water as a byproduct. Okay, so we also get plus H2 at the end of this. Disaccharides are formed by the condensation of two monosaccharides. So, see here, the OH and the H from this join together, form that, and we get water coming off. H2O, H2O, we're left with that one oxygen, and that's then going to bond with the carbon here to get the carbon 1,4 glycosidic bond. So here we're using alpha glucose and alpha glucose to form maltose. So you need to know what um, you need to know how to form each of these disaccharides here. So alpha glucose and alpha glucose form maltose, and this is a reducing sugar. Alpha glucose and galactose, which is another monosaccharide, forms lactose, which is reducing. So that lac, lact, see there, and finally sucrose, alpha glucose, and fruit fructose. The way I like to remember this is the fact that fruit is sweet, so alpha glucose and fructose makes sucrose, and that's a non-reducing sugar. So you would test that using the acid hydrolysis test, which is what we discussed before. Okay, so next, polysaccharides. Okay, so these are many monosaccharides joined together, and this is starch, for example, here. Starch is obviously found in plants, and it's made up of alpha glucose molecules. So many alpha glucose molecules join together to form starch. Starch is branched, as you can see here, it's, this is on a branch, and this means that it can be hydrolyzed by enzyme to release alpha glucose molecules which can be transported for respiration. So the branching provides this larger surface area for enzymes. So an enzyme can come along, so for example salivary amylase, uh, when, you, when you're digesting starch, um, so bread, let's say you eat bread, you secrete salivary amylase in your mouth, and then because this is branched, it's providing a larger surface area for slavery amylase so it can work at a quicker rate and therefore we can hydrolyze this glycosidic bond here to form eventually glucose which can be used for respiration also it's compact so it sort of it, it basically wounds into a coil wounds into a coil and so this means that a lot of these starch molecules can be stored in a little space in starch grains inside plants starch also finally insoluble Therefore, it doesn't affect the water potential of the cell. Okay, water potential um, is an idea that we will meet later on. Okay, glycogen. Glycogen is basically the starch equivalent, but for animals. Again, it's made of alpha glucose molecules, and it's many of these alpha glucose molecules together. However, this is even more branched than starch. Okay, so we can even so we can hydrolyze the glycosidic bond to release alpha glucose molecules at an even quicker rate, and again, the branching produces a larger surface area for enzymes. Okay, so the final polysaccharide you need to know about is cellulose, which is composed of beta glucose molecules, and is found in plant cellulose cell walls. Now, each of these molecules are rotated 180 degrees to the other, so that the OH group lies above and below the chain, allowing the successful formation of hydrogen bonds and also glycosidic bonds. So here's one beta glucose molecule, and the one next to it is flipped. So 
So it's rotated 180 degrees to the this one, its neighbouring molecule. And the one after the one after that is again flipped 180 degrees, and the one after that's flipped again. And here's our glycosidic bonds. They sort of alternate between sort of being there and then there and then there and then there. As you can see, then the OH group lies above and below the chain each time. And remember, it's the OH group which is important for the hydrogen bonds to form. Cellulose has straight unbranched chains running parallel to one another, forming microfibrils overall. So the way that I remember is the fact that cellulose has two L's in it, and these represent sort of the parallel chains. So going back to the picture before, the, these sort of run parallel to one another. So there's one here, and then there's one below it, and again and again. The hydrobonds from the OH connect the adjacent chains, forming cross links between them. So we've got one chain at the top here, and we've got one chain beneath it. The OH groups form hydrogen bonds between the chains, and these form these cross linkages or cross links. Remember, hydrogen bonds are quite weak, but it's the accumulative effect of all the individual hydrogen bonds that provides strength and rigidity for the for the cellulose molecule to function as of being part of a plant cell wall. So here are the microfibrils that I've been discussing. So here's again our, our chain, and then beneath it there'll be more, and these will run parallel to one another, and all of these then form microfibrils here. And then all of them join together to form fibril overall, which forms the cell wall of a plant. So the chains, microfibril, fibril, and cell wall. Okay, so here's a little table for you to copy down. Pause the video and uh, um, make a copy of this. Okay, moving on. Pause and have a go at the summary questions below. The answers will follow. Okay, and here are the answers. Okay, pause the video and have a go at the exam question. The answer will follow. Okay, here's the mark scheme. Now, interestingly, the mark scheme mentions a 2 to 1 ratio of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So it's probably worth learning that. Okay, so here's a challenge question for you to try now. Short solution is a chemical test for the presence of cellulose. When cellulose is present, it turns from colourless to purple. Short solution is similar to Bennett, it says that the darker the solution, the more cellulose is present. A scientist placed a plant into short solution and observed a colour change. The same plant was then placed in 300 centimetres cubed of water. Short solution was added. The scientist recorded the observation. The plant was then dried and short solution was added again. The scientist recorded the observation. The plant was still living. So suggest what three colours were seen by the scientists throughout. So here and then here, and then here. So what three colours were seen by the scientist? Pause the video and have a go. The answer will follow. Okay, so the answers are purple. It tells the question, it goes to call this to purple. Then a lighter purple, or something that's less purple. Because of the fact that you've got the plant now in 300 centimetres cubed of water and the short solution, it's going to dilute the solution so it's now less purple than before. And then the last one is now a darker purple because the water that it was placed in after it's dried and all that and remember it's still living so the plant's not dead yet and then it uses that water to produce glucose during photosynthesis and so lots of cellulose can be produced from the glucose and therefore the plant grows and so more cellulose and so the solution is darker if you have any questions or don't understand how i got to this please leave a comment below and i'll try and get back to you okay thank you very much for watching and please subscribe